lives in a world to which its own perceptions give objective reality. Its perceptions may be erroneous, but they nevertheless constitute the very reality of life for the mind that gives form to them. No other life than the life we lead in our own mind is possible. And hence the advance of the whole race depends on substituting the ideas of good, of liberty, and of order for their opposites. And this can be done only by giving some sufficient reason for accepting the new idea in place of the old. For each one of us our beliefs constitute our facts, and these beliefs can be changed only by discovering some ground for a different belief. This is briefly the rationale of the maxim that as a man thinks so he is, and from the working of this principle all the issues of life proceed. Now man's first perception of the law of cause and effect in relation to his own conduct is that the result always partakes of the quality of the cause, and since his argument is drawn from external observation only, he regards external acts as the only causes he can effectively set in operation. Hence when he attains sufficient moral enlightenment to realize that many of his acts have been such as to merit retribution he fears retribution as their proper result. Then by reason of the law that thoughts are things, the evils which he fears take form and plunge him into adverse circumstances, which again prompt him into further wrong acts, and from these come a fresh crop of fears which in their turn become externalized into fresh evils, and thus arises a circulus from which there is no escape so long as the man recognizes nothing but his external acts as a causative power in the world of his surroundings. This is the law of works, the circle of karma, the wheel of fate, from which there appears to be no escape, because the complete fulfillment of the law of our moral nature today is only sufficient for today and leaves no surplus to compensate the failure of yesterday. This is the necessary law of things as they appear from external observation only, and, so long as this conception remains, the law of each man's subjective consciousness makes it a reality for him. What is needed, therefore, is to establish the conception that external acts are not the only causative power, but that there is another law of causation, namely, that of pure thought. This is the law of faith the law of liberty, for it introduces us to a power which is able to inaugurate a new sequence of causation not related to any past actions. But this change of mental attitude cannot be brought about till we have laid hold of some fact which is sufficient to afford a reason for the change. We require some solid ground for our belief in this higher law. Ultimately we find this ground in the great truth of the eternal relation between spirit and the universal and in the particular. When we realize that substantially there is nothing else but spirit, and that we ourselves are reproductions in individuality of the intelligence and love we truly universe, we have reached the firm standing ground where we find that we can send forth our thought to produce any effect we will. We have passed beyond the idea of two opposites requiring reconciliation, into that of a duality in which there is no other opposition than that of the inner and the outer of the same unity, the polarity which is inherent in all being.